Hello again. This is uh, our next video. Hope you're having a good weekend. All right, this one here, we're going to talk about uh, Christian persecution. And um, I think it's an important topic because we're going to get a bit into rapture theory and things like this. And a lot of times what I hear coming out of the mouths of some of these people is that they say, Jesus would never want us to suffer. We're not going to suffer. We're out of here. And then the suffering starts. And that could not be further from the truth. The truth is, it's a great honor to suffer for Jesus. And he would not um, deny us that honor. That's the truth. And we're going to do a bit of Bible study here to talk about that. It's called, Take Up Your Cross and Follow Me. Now, in this scripture, in this video, we're going to learn about uh, Christian martyrs and about scriptures that talk about Christian martyrs. And we're going to learn how martyrdom and persecution are a way of life for Christians. It doesn't always happen and it doesn't have to happen. But it's part and parcel of being a Christian. It goes with the territory. And you, you have to be willing to accept that. If you, are, if you have your mind set that you are not going to suffer, you are going to fail. That's exactly what's going to happen. Because a Christian is a person who stands up for what they believe. And who will not waver. And if you have a, a, a mind that you are not going to suffer persecution and you start getting persecuted, you will fail. So I hope you stay tuned and watch the rest of this video and we'll see what the Bible and what history has to say about Christian perse persecution. And don't forget to like, subscribe and share. And thank you very much. Now smash that like button and smash that subscribe button. Okay, we're going to look at other things after this, but first we're going to take a look at some scriptures. This is Green's literal translation. Let's go to the King James. Or no, just for fun, let's go to the Tyndale Bible. This is the Tyndale Bible. Okay, uh, just a minute. We'll just do Wikipedia. I mean, it's not the greatest information if you're going to be quoting. Like, don't quote it in a book. But generally, it's, you know, gives you an idea what it's about, right? You know, just so we have a, this is, we're talking about persecution. So here, let's, William Tyndale, okay? Sometimes called Tyndale, Tyndale, Tyndale. 1494 to 1536 was an English biblical scholar and linguist who became a leading figure in the Protestant Reformation. In the le years leading up to his execution, he is well known as a translator of the Bible into English and was influenced by the works of the prominent Protestant reformers such as Martin Luther. Okay, so Tyndale was instrumental in one of the first English translations of the Bible in England. And... Uh, We'll skip forward to his betrayal and death. Oh, what's this picture here, okay? What is this? There he is. He's being tied to the stake. They're going to light him on fire. And, and, and because they wanted to be merciful to him, they strangled him first. That was just to be merciful. And he said, before he got, died, he said, Lord... Open the King of England's eyes. And um, it was, uh, I don't know how long later. Let's see, the King James Version was in 1611. And uh, Tyndale died in uh, 1535. So it wasn't, it was a hundred years later or so, not even less than a hundred years later. The King James of England 
sanctioned an English tra translation of the Holy Bible. In Tyndale's case, he was held pr in prison for a year and a half. His inquisitor, Latimus, gave him the opportunity to write a book stating his views. Latimus wrote a book in response to convince him of his errors because of what he was saying, what he was thinking. Tyndale wrote two in reply. Latimus wrote two books in response. Latimus's three books were subsequently published as one volume. In these it can be seen that discussion on heresy revolves around the contents of three other books Tyndale had written on topics like justification by faith, free will, and the denial of the soul, and so on. <laughs> Latimus makes no mention of the Bible translation. Yeah, but look at what he's look at what they're charging him for. Justification by faith and not by the not by penance by or by the Catholic Church, right? Free will, not by the will of the church, right? The denial of the soul. Is that because it was that the the salvation doesn't come out of your soul. It doesn't come from you. It comes from God. That was the argument, okay? And so on. So Melanimus doesn't talk about the Bible translation. It seems in prison Tyndale was allowed to continue making translations from the Hebrew. Thomas Cromwell was involved in some intercession or plans. After being unable to convince Ty Tyndale to abjure, Tyndale was handed over to the Brabantine secular arm and tried on charges of Lutheran heresy. Lutheran. Following Martin Luther. Okay, and teaching his teachings. Heresy. In 1536. The charges did not mention Bible translation. Of course not. No, they don't want to talk of it because he translated the Bible. They killed him for some other reason. It's the same as Jesus. They handed him over which was not illegal in the Netherlands. He was found guilty on his own admission and condemned to be executed. He was strangled to death while tied at the stake, and then his dead body was burned. His final words spoken at the stake were fervent zeal and a loud voice were, were, were reported later as Lord opened the King of England's eyes. Okay, so 1536, Tyndale was executed and his body was burned, okay? So this is Tyndale's translation of the Bible, okay? 1536. So in honor of William Tyndale, we're going to read his translation. He said unto thee, But who say ye that yet I am? Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art Christ, ye son of the living God. And Jesus, Yeshua, <laughs> answered and said to him, Happy art thou, Simon, son of Onus, Jonas. There's no J in Hebrew, right? It's Jesus and Jonas. For flesh and blood has not opened unto thee yet, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto it, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my congregation and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou bindest upon earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou loathest on earth shall be loathed in heaven. Then he charged his disciples, yet they should not tell no man, yet he was Jesus Christ. From yet time forth Jesus began to show unto his disciples how yet he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of your elders and your priests, your high priests, and of the scribes, and must be killed and rise again the third day. But Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Master, favor thyself, this shall not come unto thee. Then turned about he absolute and said to Peter, Come after me, Satan. Thou offendest me, because thou savorest not godly things, 
but worldly things. Jesus then said to his disciples, If any man will follow me, let him forsake himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. What, for, what shall it profit the man, though he should win all the whole world, yet if he lose his own soul? Or what else shall a man give to redeem his soul again with all? Okay, so there it is. If any man will follow me, let him forsake himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now the next verse, we're going to look at the King James Version here. And uh, next verse, Revelation 6.9. 6, 9. 6 9. <coughs> And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. What is the testimony that they held? That's the gospel. Okay. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, does thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? So did these people suffer? you think? And white robes were given to every one of them, and it was said to them that they should rest yet for a little season, a little while, until their fellow servants also, and their brethren, that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. There's more people coming that are going to be killed like you were. Okay? So is this something bad? Is this something that's never going to happen? This seems to be a great honor to be a part of this group, I would say. How about Revelation chapter 7? Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number of all the nations and kindreds and people and tongues. So this is the whole world stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, crying, Salvation to our God which sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God, forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying to me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? Who are this great multitude? And whence came they? Where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are they which came out of the great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. So how did they wash their robes and make them white? They went through the great tribulation. They were killed for the word of God and the gospel of Jesus. Okay. Now, Revelation chapter 14, starting in verse 7 saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the foundations of waters. So give glory to God, the Creator. Right? Not evolution. God, the Creator. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all the nations drink of the wine of of the wrath of her fornication. Wow, what's that? What's what's her fornication? Well, in the Old Testament, fornication of a city was when they would follow. Um, they they said they followed God, but they also followed idols, right? They ran after the idols, and God saw, 
talked about them as his wife that was committing fornication and committing adultery with other gods. Okay? And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worships the beast and his image, and receives his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. What's he indignant about? Worshipping other gods that don't exist when he is the creator and the only God. And shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment rise forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Okay? And this talks, it goes on to talk about the 666. And you don't have to be afraid of the number 666. It's pointing to a specific person, a specific entity. So if that's not you, then you don't have to be afraid of the number 666. Okay? So, Revelation chapter 20. So starting in verse 4, Revelation chapter 20, starting in verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given to them. So this is the saints, the people who are saved, right? And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. Oh, so did they suffer, do you think? Do you think they suffered when they were beheaded? Was there a trial? Were they led up to the gallows and beheaded? Which had not worshipped the beast, nor his image, nor had he received his mark on their foreheads, or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So the, the ones who were beheaded, because they did not receive the mark of the beast, they were part of the first resurrection. Okay? John chapter 15, verse 20. Let's take a look at Wycliffe now. This is Wycliffe's Bible. It, this is the, the first English translation in, um, I think it was in the 13th or the 14th century. He translated it from the Latin Vulgate into English, and he was burned at the stake, okay? Brought to trial and burned at the stake for talking against the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church, all right? So John Wycliffe suffered persecution. And he was a Christian, a very good one. So John chapter 15, starting in verse 20. This is a 13th century, so this is very old English, right? Have ye mind of my word, which ye said to you, The servant is not greater than his Lord. And if thee had pursued me, they should also pursue you. If they had kept my word, they should keep yours also, but they should do to all these things for my name. For they know not him that sent me. And ye have not commune, and had not spoken to them, they should not have a sin. But now they had no excuse for their sin. He that hates me hates also my father. And if ye had not done works in them, which none other man did, and if, and if I, I had not done works in them, which other, no other man did, then should they not have sin. But now both they have sinned and hate me and my father. But the word be fulfilled that is written in their law. For they hate me and hate without a cause. Without a cause. So that's John Wycliffe. There's John Wycliffe, 1328 to 1384. So he died in 1384, okay? Um, he was a, a Protestant reformer, 
He was called the, uh, the Protestants call him the morning star of the Reformation because um, he, it was, Martin Luther had read his works and, and he had inspired others to speak up for the truth. Conflict with the church, okay? He, he was conflicting with the church about the Eucharist and about other things, you know? Theological stuff. And they, the whole, the whole government came against him. When the government then was the Roman Catholic Church, the papacy, with all the kings of Europe, the Holy Roman Empire. And he went up against all of them. And he was accused of heresy and burned at the stake. There's this one. A hundred years after he died, in 1480, in England, they found his grave and they, bur they dug up his bones and they burned his bones and cursed his bones. Not that that bothered him at all, <laughs> but this is what they did, right? They declared him a heretic, they banned his writings, and they decreed that Wycliffe's works should be burnt, and his body remains removed from consecrated ground. This order, confirmed by Pope Martin V, was eventually carried out in 1428. His Wycliffe's corpse or a neighbor's, they're not sure if it was him or not, <laughs> okay in the years before his death in 1384 he increasingly argued for the scriptures as the authoritative center of Christianity, that the claims of the papacy were unhistorical, that monasticism was irredeemably corrupt, and that the moral unworthiness of priests invalidated their office and sacraments okay oh well, whether he was right or wrong they burned him at the stake for the way he talked okay and for translating the bible into english okay so here we are that's wycliffe's bible so we'll go back to the king james here John 16, verse 33. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Why will you have tribulation? Because the world hates God. And because it hates God, it will hate you too. That's why. And just because they call themselves Christian doesn't mean that they don't hate God. Now, uh, let's take a look at John 15, verse 18 to 20. This is Jesus in the upper room the night before he was crucified, or on the night of his crucifixion, in the upper room at the Last Supper. Verse 18, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So if you start talking truth about the Bible, the world will hate you. Remember the word that I said to you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they persecuted me, okay, so the Pope is not greater than the Bible. The servant is not greater than his Lord, right? If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. 
If they kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him that sent me. There's been many, many persecutions in history. Most people know this. You look at uh, the Albigensians, the, the Huss movement, John Huss, the Waldenses. These are medieval groups that were annihilated, genocided by the uh, government of the time, which was the papacy and all the kings of Europe, the Holy Roman Empire. And then in England, we had Bloody Mary, okay? This here, it's excerpts from the Fox's Book of Martyrs. It's a pretty good book if you want to learn about Christian martyrs and why, how they stood up to give us freedom and to give us the Bible so that we could read it ourselves and freedom to talk about what we want to talk about and freedom to say what we believe. They brought that to us. Okay, the Fox's Book of Martyrs, this is only excerpts from it. The original book, the, the original volume was 3.5 million words. It was huge. And it's all these stories of these martyrs in England. See, John, John Fox, he was a, a, a Bible scholar. And um, he was a Protestant. And, and he was part of the group of scholars that had to flee England when Queen Mary, Bloody Mary, the Catholic Queen, became queen. And they fleed England uh, to escape persecution. And um, he was working on his book of martyrs and working on Bible translations, uh, helping other scholars. And he collected all these stories, hundreds of stories of martyrs who were burned at the stake or drawn and quartered or all kinds of other things done to them because of what they believed. And just simply because they were trying to bring an English Bible to the English people and they were and they were reading the Bible and disagreeing with what the government was teaching them and that was that was all it was this led to a parliament this led to um, um, individual rights this led to um, the will of the people voting for parliamentarians because they didn't want the Pope and his kings to rule over them anymore. That's what brought us freedom. That's what the West was founded on. And if you want to, if you want proof of that, just read the Declaration of Independence of the USA. They'll talk about the right of kings. And they'll say, they don't necessarily mention the Pope, but they talk about the right of kings. And the right of kings says that if God sets up a king, you have to do what a king says. But they say if a king is a tyrant, it is not only the, the, uh, the right, but it is also the duty of the people to overthrow him and to make him do what God wants him to do. Right? That's, that's what the United States is founded upon. And people seem to have forgotten that, but that, that is what it was founded upon. Now, uh, here's one, one there's, there's a, this original volume was full of woodcuts. Now, there was a, a one um, theologian named Thomas Kramer. Kramer, he, he um, wrote, he was helping Tyndale with his translations. And... Um, he wrote a recantation letter because he was in prison for months. Bread and water. My prison wasn't like prison today. It was like a 10 foot square cell in the dark with bread and water for months. And he wrote a recantation letter 
And then he recanted his recantation. And then he was brought to be burned at the stake. And when he was burned at the stake, before the fire got to him, he stuck his hand, the hand that wrote that letter, he stuck it in the fire. And he said, let this hand burn first. And God, please forgive me for writing that recantation letter. And here's a woodcut. There he is, sticking his hand in the fire. And this book is just full of them. This is from the 16, 16th century England. The burning of Lawrence Saunders. And you see, this book was written, this was like a... a to get past the misinformation of the government. This book was written to tell people what was going on in all the towns in England. That all these people are being burned at the stake. And what they're burned for. Because they're, they were being presented by the government as enemies of the people. Enemies of the state. Right? They weren't enemies of the state. They were friends of God. That's why they were being burned. So, there's that. Now, I know the answer now. The answer people will say now, well, but they don't do that anymore. That doesn't happen anymore. Well, let's take a look. Okay, you ready? World Watch List 2023. Serving Persecuted Christians. It's an annual ranking, ranking of the 50 country, countries where Christians face the most extreme persecution. Just because we don't see it here in Canada or in the USA doesn't mean that it's not happening all over the place. Okay, where, where are we seeing it here? North Africa, Middle East, India, China, Japan. Russia, Indonesia, Mexico, Cuba, Colombia, Nicaragua, three hundred and sixty million Christians suffer high levels of persecution and discrimination for their faith. Well, you would you dare to do for Jesus? 5,621 Christians murdered, 2,110 churches attacked, 4,500 Christians detrained. Afghanistan. Could you imagine being a Christian in Afghanistan? <laughs> you know, not a good place to be a Christian. <laughs> So these are PDF files, right? Bhutan, uh, China. Could you imagine being? See, in China they have a they they allow Christians, but they have a Christian Bible and a Christian church that is sanctioned by the government. And if you want to be a Christian, that's the kind of Christian you have to be. You can't be any other kind of Christian. Colombia. Let's take a look at another thing. Let's go right to the Catholic Encyclopedia, Council of Trent. The 19th Ecumenical Council opened at Trent and closed on Trent at 4th of December 1563. Its main object was the definitive determination of the doctrines of the Church in answer to heresies of the Protestants. A further object was the execution of a thorough reform of the inner life of the Church by removing numerous abuses that had developed in it. Is the Council of Trent still valid? Answer and explanation. Yes, the Council of Trent is still in effect. In Catholic and Orthodox tradition, a valid ecumenical council as guided by the Holy Spirit is infallible and cannot be replied. Okay? It's the, cate it's the catechism of the Catholic Church. Right? Why is the Council of Trent important today? The Council of Trent 
focused on defending and elaborating the Catholic doctrine as well as answering the criticisms of members of the Protestant faith. It affirmed that both faith and works were necessary for salvation, clarified importance of sacraments, and improved clergy discipline and education. Translations of the books of the Old Testament may, in the judgment of the bishop, be permitted to be learned and, and pious men only, provided such translations are used only as elucidations of the Vulgate edition for the understanding of the Holy Scriptures and not as the sound text. Tr translations of the New Testament made by authors of the first class of this list shall be permitted to no one. So, so you're not allowed to translate the New Testament since the great danger and little usefulness usually results to readers from their perusal. So no, you're not, you're not smart enough to translate or to read the New Testament. All books which have been condemned either by supreme pontiffs or by ecumenical councils before the year 1515 and are not contained in this list shall be considered condemned in the same manner as they were formerly condemned. Like the Book of Enoch, right? And the books of those heresiarchs, heresiarchs, that means the Martin Luther and John Wycliffe and William Tyndale, heresiarchs, what a word, eh? Who after a foresaid year originated or revived heresies, as well of those that have been the heads of leaders of heretics, as Luther, they even named them, Luther, Zwingli, Calvin, Balf, Balthasar, Friedberg, Swain Dick, and others like these, whatever be their name, title, nature, or their heresy, are absolutely forbidden. The books of other heretics, however, which deal professedly with religion, are absolutely condemned. So you see, um, they're not against bad, they're not against translations, they're only against bad translations like the King James Bible, <laughs> or, or maybe even the New, New International Version, or maybe even uh, the Jehovah Witness Bible, or only the Bibles that are not Catholic Bibles. They're against all those Bibles, you see. So they're not against the Bible, just any Bible that's not their Bible. And yes, it still is the defining law of the Roman Catholic Church. They just don't, you know, you, you can have laws that you're not necessarily enforcing yet. So they're gathering all these Protestants in, in the ecumenical councils and their ecumenical movement to bring the separate, separated brethren back into the mother church, the mother of the harlots. And all the harlots are joining together with her. And once they have power, and once they, they have a absolute authority, that's when you'll really see what they're really like. And mark my words, mark my words, the mark of the beast is coming. It will happen. I don't know if it'll happen in my lifetime, like a hundred years in, in the span of history, a hundred years is not a long time. So it's hard to say if it'll happen in a hundred years or in ten years or five years. We don't know. But mark my words, it will happen. Because it's prophesied to happen. And, and persecution is one of the ways God allows this to happen so that he will know who will stand up for him and who won't. That's what it's for. So these people who say, we're not going to suffer, we're not going to be persecuted, they will fail. They will absolutely fail because they're not prepared for it. So, you know, it's like a preppers say, right? You hope for the best and prepare for the worst. So you believe, believe the words of Jesus and the apostles. And you believe the words in the revelation. It will happen. But it might not happen in my lifetime.
so I'm prepared for it. But if it doesn't happen in my lifetime, then uh, it doesn't happen. Doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Okay, I hope I've showed you enough to see that persecution is not alien to the Christian church. And that it's not a bad thing. It's actually a great honor to be included with the martyrs and, and the apostles and the prophets and Jesus Christ himself. They were all persecuted. And Jesus said, pick up your cross and follow me. And that's what he was talking about. Is even if you don't get burned at the stake or killed for your beliefs, when you carry those beliefs and people get wind of it, you will uh, be challenged and you will be sidelined. You will lose friends. You will lose jobs. You will lose a lot. Um, you won't be riding on top of the world. You'll be under the world. You'll be under the bus of the world and um, it's just the way it is and um, it's a great honor to, to uh, stand up for what you believe in no matter what other people think of it and be open to to learning uh, new things but don't let go of your convictions either so you know, as far as Christianity goes, the whole world is following after the beast. It's, it's, uh, it's craziness. I can't even fathom it anymore. They're like, get rich quick and, and we don't have to suffer. Uh, God wants us to be a bunch of idiot millionaires running around spending money. Um, God never talked about that in the Bible. Um, yeah, he talked about prosperity, but it's not about um, amassing possessions and, and amassing wealth. It's about amassing knowledge of God and standing up for what you believe in. That's what it's about. That is great riches. And all of the prophets and, and the apostles and Christians all through history have been persecuted. So, um, you know, it's not like we ha have a great joy in doing that, but uh, we're ready for it. And when there's a lull like this, the, 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 the beast is just gathering uh, energy before it rears its ugly head again. And it's guaranteed it will happen. It's written. It is written in the prophets. So, one more thing I wanted to show you, just to give you an anchor into what's real and what is not. Okay, Genesis chapter 8, down the bottom, after Noah's ark landed and Noah offered offerings to the Lord, verse 21, and the Lord smelled a sweet savor and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, the summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. Okay, seed time and harvest. Cold and heat, no more floods. The, the Arctic is not going to melt and flood the earth. Seed time and harvest will keep on going. Summer and winter will keep happening. Day and night will keep happening. As long as the earth remains, it will not cease. Then in chapter 9, Verse 8, And God said, so spoke to Noah and his sons with him, saying, Behold, I will establish my covenant with you, and with your seed after you, and with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl of the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall be there any more a flood 
to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the clouds, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth, the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. So whenever you're walking over a sidewalk that looks like a rainbow, think about God and that He's not going to use the weather against us anymore. He's not going to bring floods. Seed time and harvest is not going to end. The farmers will keep farming. Summer and winter will keep happening until the as long as the earth remains. And whenever you see a rainbow in the sky or a rainbow on the sidewalk, that is a symbol of God's promise that the weather is not going to fail for us. So that brings us to the end of our video for today. I thank you for watching and I hope that you learned a lot from this. Um, you know, you don't always uh, believe everything you hear out there on the internet. And uh, Christianity has not changed and you know, it's a lull in the battle. I guess you could say, but the battle is not over. I'll see you next week. Don't forget to like, share, and smash that like button and subscribe. Thank you.